Well, hello and welcome everyone. I am so excited to bring you another episode of the Health, Wisdom and Wealth TV show. I'm Vilan Hawkins, your host, and I have got the amazing Dr. Elizabeth Rosner, affectionately known as Dr. Roz, <laughs> on the show with us today. And if you've ever wanted to know the truth about health, wisdom, and or wealth, it's spoken right here on the show. And so kick back or pull a, ch a, a chair up to the table, grab your coffee or your afternoon water, and just chime in here with us. Just help us hold the space because we're on a conversation that's a very important conversation about nonviolence, a courageous way towards healthy living. And I bet you were like I was until I got into this conversation with Dr. Rice. Didn't really think of violence and nonviolence in the space of you know healthy living, except you know in the context of social justice and um, you know being in that space of conflict and conflict resolution. But we happen to get into a couple of points that I think you're going to find very interesting as we move into this conversation, because what we discovered was it spans, what I discovered was it spans across multiple spaces that we travel in, including, you know, things that you don't think about like sleep, um, nonviolence, sleep. Yeah. You ever woke up sweating, feeling like you just went into battle with somebody? I mean, that is all a part of what we're going to bring into the conversation because we're here doing powerful conversations for living your best life. And I want to say, welcome, Dr. Roz. Thank you. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here with you, V-Lynn. I am one of your biggest fans and I have followed this closely. And so when you asked me to be a guest, I was elated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, it's just a delight to be here. Well, thank you for being here. And for our audience, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Roz because she is an up and coming new entrepreneur, having been in the uh, education world for decades. She's now considered a career path architect, a teacher, an education uh, strategist, and a certified trainer for the Dr. Martin Luther King's philosophy and his methodology of nonviolence to explore today's topic nonviolence, a courageous way towards healthy living. So a little bit about Dr. Roz, she's guiding young people to, deliver, to discover their purpose and passion using her blueprint called GRIT. She teaches students of all ages how to leverage the $30 billion that's available in grants and scholarships along with multiple streams of funding, ensuring that people can have a strategy and a framework to graduate college and universities fully debt-free. Now, does that sound like that's something interesting to you? Another form of violence or nonviolence? Mm -hmm. uh, but Dr. Roz is a certified trainer for the MLK, for MLK's philosophy and methodology on nonviolence and the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, also known as the King Center, was established in 1968 by Mrs. Coretta Scott King and nearly 1 million people have gone to this global destination, this resource center and community institution for over a quarter of a century. So over the last 25 years, oh my God, it's that all, um, but a million people. And it's really been a pilgrimage and for some people a rite of passage because there's so much rich history there. And the new site in Washington, DC, I'm happy to say, I'm looking forward to getting there myself. But one of the things that has always inspired me was a quote that um, I got from Dr. King where he said, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education, and culture for their minds, 
dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. And that's one of the things that we're going to be in conversation about today. So mm-hmm. once again, welcome, Dr. Roz. I am so glad to be here with you and to know that there are so many that are going to hear the wisdom that you're going to impart to us today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, V. Lynn. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be with your audience. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk about nonviolence and um, certainly the way that Dr. King has impacted my life and, um, you know, ways that he can um, still speak into us so clearly and distinctly, um, you know, so many years after his assassination and then about debt-free degree. That's also a form of nonviolence. So it's great to be here. Well, I'm just going to say, let's jump right in because I've got some great questions for you. I just, uh, I'm so inspired by the thinking and the dialogue that this is going to bring about. And, you know, I just gave our audience a little bit of information about you. So tell us a little bit about your journey, about what brought you to debt-free degree and becoming a certified trainer at the King Center. (laughs) Uh, I know we are on a limited time frame, so I'm going to hit some of the highlights because that's, um, that can be two different trajectories and it seems like, well, how did that come together? Um, But, you know, um, one of the things I'll say is uh, for those of you that are listening, wherever you are, whatever stage of life you're in, um, don't count yourself out. And while it's important to begin with the end in mind, to have that next goal in mind, sometimes we have these other things that take us, you know, far afield, and that ends up exactly where we're supposed to be. So when I was a college student, I loved college. I loved everything about it. And I wanted to be, I I love learning. And so I wanted to be a perpetual student. And one way to be a perpetual student is to be a teacher and work on college campuses. And so that was ultimately my goal. So, um, of course, I couldn't do that until I got a master's degree. So that was a bit of a trajectory. Ended up um, uh, getting my master's degree from San Diego State University. My son was only four months old and was not sleeping through the night. And I got an email that said, hey, um, we've got this grant and um, and um, you, it will completely pay for your master's. The way that you pay for it is you work two years for every year you're in school. So I said, okay, free master's. And, you know, I get to keep doing what I'm doing. That sounds great. But there are always sacrifices, right? And so, you know, my son wasn't sleeping through the night. I would get up and feed him and read him my textbook about rehabilitation counseling. And so um, it just, it, it started um, really with my undergrad in terms of, I don't want to go into debt to get more education, to get more degrees. And I thought that everybody had this mindset. And so it didn't become clear to me until um, probably 2005 was really when it when it hit me, because prior to then, when I was working for vocational rehab, I was helping students go to college debt free um, through the vocational rehab program. And so I didn't understand that mainstream students um, were just accepting all of these loans. Well, today, there are over 2 million students that owe over $100,000. And the average college debt is $50,000. So um, I took my 30 plus years in um, you know, being tangential to higher ed. So lots of different experiences, disability services, career services. Um, I taught in teacher ed and hearing students just say, well, I just took loans, you know, I just took loans. And so that was my higher ed trajectory. My nonviolence trajectory is a little, um, certainly a little more off the, you know, just not a, a straight line trajectory, I'll say. So I graduated high school, I'm proud to say, in the last millennium, and my high school was 50% black, 50% white. So I thought when I graduated high school that I graduated into a post-racial society. And again, 2005, so I I started a new job at North Georgia in 2005. I also had the opportunity to begin my free PhD. I can get into that a little bit later. And in that program, um, I read the book Race Matters by Dr. Cornell West. And that is what started my journey. It opened my eyes that everything that I had been taught, um, 
some of it was completely untrue. Some of it was a distortion of the truth. Some of it was because it was unspoken that I thought it was one way and really it was another way. And so um, that really started my journey on thinking about that. So, you know, um, while I went to high school, um, you know, we're in an integrated um, school, we didn't have tons of integration in terms of our college prep classes, or, you know, if we were all the different ways that there were disparities. And now that I've worked in um, vocational rehab, and I, I've done, you know, work in special ed with IEPs, I understand the preponderance of um, students of color who are diagnosed or labeled diagnosed as students with disabilities. And so there's just all of these different ways where, um, where, where the, the intersection should have been apparent and it wasn't. And so I am grateful to Dr. West. So that, that was um, the first place. The second place, <coughs> lots of different things happened between 05 and, and um, 2018. In 2018, um, just prior to that, I had started following the King Center on Twitter. And they announced that they were going to do a two-day orientation to Dr. King's methodology and philosophy of nonviolence. And so the minute it opened up, I signed up. I said, I, I really want to know about this. And I, they were so much was unpacked for me. So much was made clear to me. Um, again, many of those misconceptions that I had. And um, V. Lynn and I have a mentor, Roger James Hamilton, who is the founder of Genius U. And one of the things that he says is our identity, who we are, our identity is our dent in the universe. And it was sitting, I, I can remember exactly in the chair where I was sitting at the King Center. And I thought my identity is to teach nonviolence all over the world, whatever that looks like, you know, if it's just to one other person. And so that's been my mission since then. Um, having no idea that um, Dr. Bernice King, Martin Luther King's youngest daughter, um, CEO of the King Center, would reach out and say, um, I'm being asked to teach my father's philosophy, you know, again, all over the world. Um, I'm assembling a training team. Are you interested? And I said, absolutely. I mean, number one, who's going to say no to Dr. Bernice King? Whatever she asked me to do, I'm absolutely going to do. Um, and, um, and that really started me thinking about where are all the ways that we can apply nonviolence in every aspect of our life. So not that it's, um, and that's one of the great things about the King Center too, is they do a great job. We, now I'm there. So we do a great job at saying, okay, here's, here's some theory, here's some, you know, some ideas that are difficult to wrap your head around, and also here are some very actionable steps. Here's a very actionable framework that you can work with and wrestle with, and um, that's a very glossed over version of how debt-free degree and nonviolence and where I, where I landed today came from. And with that said, you're applying all of this by training people through the King Center and teaching your course on debt-free degree. Right. And you're doing a couple of other things. What else are you doing that actually is the integration of the two of those huge projects? I would say really for, for me personally, um, in addition, so there's, there's two different things. There's, there's stuff I do for Dr. Ra's, um, beloved community coalition is the name of my company. And, um, that's the overarching, um, understanding and mission to teach nonviolence all over the world, <clears throat> but it's, um, but it's all to come around what's going on at the King Center. So I kind of wear two hats. So there's like sort of the Dr. Raz hat, and then there's the certified trainer for the King Center hat. So outside of the King Center, because we have amazing things going on at the King Center, um, but outside of that, um, the debt-free degree and teaching high school students, I just got off a call today. There's a, a group um, that's focused on um, financial wellness and um, they, within this group, they have an education committee. And um, I said, yes, I am all in. I, I want students to understand that they don't have to accept student loans. 
<coughs> excuse me, I want people to understand that there's a mindset shift that has to happen. And so um, that's really where, where the nonviolence piece comes in, in terms of colleges and debt-free degree. Of course, then we talk about Dr. King's philosophy and what does that look like and ways that they can apply it. Um, and ways that, um, you know, social justice is so important to this generation right now. And, um, you know, I think millennials really got a bad rap in a lot of ways. You know, people kind of lump millennials together and say they're lazy or they're this or they're that. Well, my experience with millennials was not that at all. And certainly Gen Z has their own labels. But I'm telling you, this generation, I am so full of hope. I am full of excitement watching them um, understand social justice, understand um, ways that we hope that things will change. And um, in many ways, even without formally studying Dr. King, they're embracing his philosophy and methodology in some ways. And then we encourage them to come through the King Center. That's beautiful. And um, I, I have been blessed to personally experience some of that in one of the component programs that you've done called GRIT yeah. and helped to take that into the high school ROTC programs um, starting out in Gwinnett County. So I'd like to actually put a plug in that um, if there is anyone that you know that's a kid in the ROTC program in any school right now in Gwinnett County, um, although it can be anywhere because it's over Zoom. Um, let Dr. Roz know the program is phenomenal. We've already taken, what, 90, 90 kids through it? We had 60 plus, so. 30. we've taken 90 kids through that program. Yeah. And we are looking at a goal of 500 by the end of the year. And we could only make that happen with your help helping to make the connection with the leadership of these programs. And why do we focus on those programs? Was there, was, there, was, there were a couple of reasons. One was my grandson's in one of those programs right. in the Parkview High School Marine Corps Junior ROTC. But the other is because when I got introduced to Dr. Roz's GRIT program, I was just actually blown away because the content was so valuable and relevant and leading into debt-free kids thinking about going to school, doing it debt-free. Yes. You know, as a parental culture, we think about going to school and one of the options is, you know, my savings. You know, um, how much is that? Will it be exhausted by the time that I finish? And if I don't want it to be exhausted, what does that mean? Balancing mm -hmm. loans and, you know, other debt vehicles, um, even if it's loans from family, um, you know, there's still other alternatives and something that we as parents um, didn't have for ourselves. So we don't think about it necessarily for our kids. Right. And I love this because the nonviolent aspect of it is actually sharing it into the yes. world. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it's twofold. It's sharing it into the world. That's number one. But it's also um, teaching people this different, this mindset shift. So um, think about the community impact. If the average student loan debt is $50,000. Think about if you get this degree from <clears throat> this school and you graduate with $50,000 in debt versus same degree, same school, no debt. What is your personal impact? What is your community impact? What are the different ways that you can, you know, if you're not making that loan payment, what are you making spending that money on? And um, how can you impact your community? How can you give back? if you have time that, that you're not spending. So it's it's the cyclical thing in terms of debt-free degree, but that's also the case for nonviolence. So um, in a perfect world, um, I'm attending a webinar in the next few weeks with um, someone who is the leading um, educator on Kingian nonviolence in K-12 schools. And she's doing a webinar. And so my, my vision would be, um, and I wanna talk to her a little bit more about this, is to have K-12 schools that are based on 
King's methodology and philosophy. And by the time those people graduate and become 100 years old, where they've taught their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And this is like a global movement in terms of nonviolence. And then just a small piece of that is the nonviolence, I mean, the uh, debt free degree piece, because um, there's this mindset that we all need violence to survive. And there's this mindset that in order to go to college, you have to have loans or you have to write, write the check for full tuition. Like there's, there's not two options. And um, some of it has to do with honestly, um, education. Some of it has to do with ways that people who are accepting the loans view things. So I've encountered more than one set of parents who feel like one way to show love is to accept student loan debt to let their child go to whatever school they want to go to. And I'm not discounting that they love their child. Obviously, I know that they love their child. But what would it look like if they said, but here's this $30 billion in scholarships that we can access. Let's do that. And then, um, like, I, I had a, a mom um, last semester who, you know, asked her, asked me to work with her child. And it was because they were going to pay off her student loans. They wanted her to have skin in the game. So they were asking her to accept student loans. And so their plan was all along to pay off those student loans at the end for a graduation present. They just wanted her again to be invested. But once she heard my program, she said, I would much rather buy her a car or give her a down payment for a home <coughs> excuse me so it's it's thinking about things differently and thinking about if we have these resources how are we going to use those and um and some of it does have to do with sowing and reaping and making choices you know and and that comes um down to it and i i spoke to a lady last week that um was referred to me i don't i don't know if she's going to work with me or not but um we had our our strategy call last week and she was saying she wants to be a nurse practitioner and she's probably 45 ish right now so she's um she's had her family and she's now wanting to go back to school for herself she's in an online for-profit institution and she's about halfway through her bachelor's degree but she knows she's got master's and then you know continue education to be a nurse practitioner. But just, I said, how much is the bachelor's degree going to cost you? And she said, $50,000. And I said, how long will it take you as a nurse practitioner just to pay off that $50,000, not in addition to the other two degrees that you have to have? And v -Lynn, this look just came over her face. And she said, I don't know. That never occurred to me to think about that. So we think long time that things mm -hmm. are you know like that's how people process we i think the world should process things from a nonviolence lens and yet there's all this world out there that says this whole different narrative or this whole different thing or here's this shiny object over here let's just focus on this and let's not focus on how we get there or what it's going to cost us to get there and so it's getting people to think differently have but like I said, a mindset shift, but just understanding there are more pieces to it. We often hear about investing in yourself. And uh, most of the time we equate that to, you know, a commitment of dollars and cents. And um, you're right. It is a mindset shift to think of that commitment as being dollars that don't have to get spent and since that is part of your education, your wisdom that you're able to pass on to others as well. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting because it, the concept is not new, you know, and um, I remember too being in a conversation where a lot of um, parents were thinking, you know, well, you can do work study. And you can pay for your schooling as you go along, not accumulating debt. Yet, we all know that in the midst of it all, when life starts to happen, what's the first thing that goes to the wayside mm -hmm. is the, the, the long-term goal. Right. You know, let me just put it on hold. I need to do this now. And then how hard is it to get back to it? Yeah. Or you're fighting to stay in that space where you can continue your education in spite of all the stuff that's going on. And 
what we don't do, which is part of the conversation that you and I have been in, is recognize the fact that that is a violent situation that we are in. There are nonviolent means of addressing it, mm -hmm. which is where we get lost. So talk to us a little bit about you know, the concept and the definition of nonviolence as it relates to life, you know, not just social justice and conflict out in the world, but we're moving through life. And tell us a little bit about Dr. King's philosophy on nonviolence that helps us to navigate that. Yes. Uh, so at the King Center, our definition of nonviolence is nonviolence is a love centered way of thinking, speaking, and acting that leads <clears throat> to personal, cultural, and societal transformation. So it starts with me. It starts with me. I have to make sure that my thinking, speaking, and acting is from a place of nonviolence. And then when I do that, then I can impact my immediate grief and my culture and then out into society. So um, you and I met a year and a half ago, and I don't know how much you knew about the King Center before then, but then we've had many, many, many conversations. That, that to me is what it's all about. Let's just continue having these conversations one-on-one, -on -one, and then if it opens up to, you know, like being on your TV program, which how amazing is that? I, um, I recently spoke with a group from the UK who is connected with Dr. Dennis Kimbrough and the, the Kimbrough Success Academy and had a conversation with them. And so you just don't know what that next conversation is. And that's also what's beautiful really about life and also about my trajectory. But for every single person watching, you know, if I had said to myself at 20, at 50 years old, I want to be on a TV show with V. Lynn Hawkins to be discussing Dr. King's theory and philosophy of nonviolence none of that was on my radar, none of that, you know, and so it's walking that out and being open to opportunities, being open to having new experiences and new things. So Dr. King has six principles and six steps to addressing conflict. So all of this is on the website, thekingcenter.org. And so when you look at those principles, what does that look like for me as an individual? And then, um, you know, for example, if, um, if nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. How does that show up for me in terms of my social media? And I'm, I have not always been perfect at that, but now if there's a situation on social media and I may wanna type something, then um, Backspace is my friend. And then I just, I don't, you know, they're just things that you think about. What is a love-centered way? Um, if you have conversations with people where it's evident that they want to have a debate and not a discussion where it's, you know, I'm the winner and you're the loser and I'm the smart one and you're not, then um, how can you switch, switch that to say, I, I really want to hear where you're coming from and um, I really want to have a conversation that, that brings it to that next level, that it's not, um, it's not looking to, you know, just defeat them, but you have to, again, it starts with me. And so <laughs> looking at the different ways that we can um, put this framework into work for ourselves and then, you know, with my students, how is it that I can, can demonstrate this to them? How is it that, um, you know, if one of them, you know, misses an appointment or, you know, says that they're going to apply for this, this, and this, and they haven't done it. What, what does that look like in terms of with my students? Um, but also it's, it's encouraging people in, um, you know, even when I'm speaking to say a big group of high school students, even if none of them ever contact me again, I hope that I've planted a seed. I hope that there's something there. Um, and I believe in sowing and reaping. And one of the great things about sowing and reaping is if I sow an apple seed, I do not reap an apple seed. I reap a tree that's going to produce all of these apples with all of these seeds. And eventually you're going to reap a harvest. And so it's exponential. And that's also the beauty of nonviolence is it's exponential. Wow, that's amazing. And something that you have brought into um, real relevancy because it does start with us. And yes. um, I happened as I was out there looking at the website to notice throughout that there's a reference, be love, 
to create the beloved community. I love that. So tell us a little bit more about what that is and why it's significant. Many, um, many of Dr. King's um, principles are, are based on love. The beloved community, as um, Mrs. King talked about it, is um, it's uh, achievable and realistic. It's not this utopia that we're going to get there, you know, in our next life. That it, it's something that we can we can have here. So the Be Love campaign. There's this wonderful pledge online and the be love campaign is all about who we are as people and again then how are we um influencing our immediate circle of people and then a little bit broader and a little bit broader and so if you think about beloved be love what does that mean to be love what does that mean to show up in spaces where um, a typical conversation may be going on and um somebody says oh well you voted this way so we can't be friends anymore or um, you're wearing that designer and so we can't be friends anymore, or you support that particular football team and so, you know, I, I can't, you know, hang out with you or whatever. What does that mean to show up to be love? And um, Dr. King talked a lot about it in terms of, um, you know, his writing and in his sermons and in the campaigns that he launched. And so we discussed that. Um, there are, um, I don't know if V. Lynn can share this graphic, but I, I can give it to her. But we are doing this be love campaign uh, once a month um, through the summer and um, scholarships are available and we encourage folks to apply for scholarships but this last one that we did um, in February we had folks I mean it was not just in the U.S. we had folks from all over the world joining in and I have some friends from South Africa that are interested in it and so you know it's not just be love in Atlanta Georgia it's be love literally all over the world and how does that what does that look like? You know, if um, if you're in a situation and you have a choice on your reaction, your behavior, it's it's choosing the loving response. It's choosing how to love on one another. That is beautiful. I did notice that in there, uh, it's set up where you can sign up for any month. I believe it's like happening so. every month. Right. And um, it's beautiful to know that it's not only a place where you'll be able to learn things to support you and who you serve, whether it's family or, you know, within your own community or your church, right. but it is also a place where you will meet others right. who are there learning the same things in order to do the same things. And that's a synergy that, yes. um, you know, is, is also in its own right relevant and special in today's yes. world, in today's yes. time, very yes. needed. Yes. Yeah, uh, it was, I think it was in December, um, the Pope had an article where he had embraced nonviolence and Dr. King's philosophy and methodology, and he wrote an article, um, and there was a, a big um, conference, and it ended, it was on Zoom, and so I ended up in um, Zoom rooms with um, a nun from Australia, um, another person who was serving in the Catholic Church in South Korea, and of course, if you looked at my LinkedIn, I have Korean in, in my profile on LinkedIn because I'm so closely tied to the Korean community here in Northeast Atlanta, and so it was just this great synergy to see these people from literally all over the world who are saying, it, it's time to come together. It's time to be loved, to build the beloved community. And um, what does that look like? And we're absolutely going to have conflict, but how do we address that conflict? Mm -hmm. And we address it so much more effectively when we are in a collective because the energy is so supportive and powerful. Um, I, 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 had, I just... I look to all of the reasons and the ways that we can do that. And this is definitely one. You know, a lot of the conversation that I'm in is typically around um, the concept of using food as medicine. Yeah. Nonviolence is also a form of medicine. Yes, it is. And we need to look to it, I believe, in the same weight and scale as we do food. And with what's needed in our society on a global level as it relates to food is going back to 
the beginning and yes. the beginning being, you know, food from the ground, plant, you know, whole foods, plant foods, root foods, um, seeds, nuts, and um, herbs and spices all are a part of the original foods. And Dr. King's philosophy is also a part of the original means of community and how we create, sustain, and grow a cohesive community. And we're talking about with technology having come in the way that it is, it's not going anywhere. We have to, I think we are compelled to look at how we use technology today as yeah. a means to support the shifts that we're talking about. Yeah. Because we can, we can no longer afford the separation. We can no longer afford the devastation from wars and, and just the violence right. that occurs. And right. we know that there's going to be misunderstandings. We know that there's going to be disagreements. We know that there's going to be conflict. Yeah. But it's how you deal with conflict yeah. that is the shift yes. that's needed. It's yeah. how you deal with the conflict in the body because of illness. And, you know, most of the things that people suffer from as illness in the body right now, are, it's, it's all foodborne. Yes. Yeah. Foodborne diseases, foodborne illnesses, and it's affecting more of our children now. This is the first generation of children coming up now who's, it's being predicted that they will not outlive their parents. Wow. Wow. It is now being predicted they will not outlive their parents unless something changes, unless wow. like you were talking about the mindset changes and it changes because I, I love Dr. Um, Maya Angelou yeah. talked about how, you know, you can't do better when you don't know better, but when That's you right. know better, you can yes. do better. And it's your responsibility to do better. Yes. And one of the things that we're doing is really disrupting the air of complacency. Yes. And, yes. you know, oh, it's okay. It's going to blow over. No, no, don't let it blow over. Let's bring it into a new context, right. a new right. Right. way of perceiving the end result. And, you know, we've in business, yes. in life, kids in high school are learning, think with the end in, law, in mind, um, not necessarily knowing where it's going to yeah. play out in how they're moving forward in life. This is one of those ways. We have to see a different end than the one that history could provide for us in the way of war and violence and, yes. you know, war and violence in our bodies because of what we eat war and violence, you know, because of what we eat that comes out in the energy that perpetuates other right. wars and violence out there. Right. And right. love is the key. You know, yeah. we used, I, I used to hear love is the key. Love is the key. Love is the key. They drew, they made songs about it. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it became something that didn't carry the same meaning that it should have, that it could have that we wanted it to. And now it's all coming back full circle with the age of Aquarius. Yeah. With, yes, yes. With all that's coming in, you know, what is it, 30 years since Dr. King, 40 years since Dr. King, and we are now bringing more he of this He was assassinated philosophy. in 68. So King 60, was assassinated in 68. 68 to now, let me get my calculator out. <laughs> but it's, yeah. you yeah. know, 50 yeah. years. And we are mm -hmm. now really giving the momentum in, you know, adding momentum into the movement uh, of mm -hmm. nonviolence, of using food mm -hmm. as medicine, of, you know, getting out there and not, I mean, I used to, in my classes, I used to tell people, you know, we're going to get to the point where you don't feel like parking far away so that you can walk not only into the mall, but around the mall to do what you have to do or the grocery store. And now it's like, yes, do that. Right. Park far away so that right. you can get those extra steps in. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
just this the weekend, mall. my uh, my daughter, my adopted daughter was in town and she has a, a Peloton bike and she said they have a Peloton app and um, she said, why don't you get on the app with me and then I can hold you accountable. And I said, oh, great. So, um, you know, prior to COVID, I would go to the gym, but it certainly wasn't every day, but I have been during COVID doing yoga or weights or something here every day and um, I'm one of those people that prefers to exercise inside I mean everybody needs to do what they need to do and I understand sunshine and fresh air and the importance of all of that but for me that's that's what works best for me and so um, I, I signed up this weekend and yesterday this morning I get up and there's a text from her hey how was your yoga class yesterday it was so nice that somebody in a complete other state is you know holding me accountable for doing some something that um that i need to do for myself that's healthy that's building that's talking about beloved community how am i showing love to elizabeth if yes. i'm doing some sort of exercise or movement every single day um and the uh the other thing that um your conversation made me th think about is this weekend I just, you know, happened to be on my phone and, and I saw an alert and it said um, free food forest near world's busiest airport. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking the world's busiest airport I thought was Atlanta. So where's this free food forest? And, and then what is now <coughs> the world's busiest airport? Well, guess what? It is Atlanta. And so there's a free food forest south of Atlanta, very close to the airport. I forget how many acres it is. And I think it was supposed to be condos and maybe it went into, um, you know, either, uh, I think the city of Atlanta bought or something. I don't remember all the details, but it's a true free food forest for folks. And in there, it said for folks who a grocery store is a 30 minute bus ride. Think about that a 30 minute bus ride. When you think about just in the state of Georgia, there's 159 counties. How many counties don't have an OBGYN, number one? And number two, how many counties don't have a health professional? And let me tell you what a definition of health professional is, a CVS, any type of pharmacy. There are a few counties that have zero health professionals, no pharmacy whatsoever. So when, when how, how can we, you know, love on people? How can we be community? How can we understand that for the folks that are homeless, for the folks that are, you know, without shelter right now, for the folks that are living with food insecurity, they're my brother and sister. And so because we're all interconnected, you know, when Dr. King says, I can't be all I'm supposed to be until V. Lynn is all V. Lynn is supposed to be until the hungry person is all that the hungry person is meant to be. And we're all interconnected. We're not independent. And so understanding that that's one of those myths that um, that 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 two day orientation to Dr. King, that that's one of the things that unpacked for me because I have been taught you do it on your own. You're independent. You forge your own path. You don't need anybody. <coughs> blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> That's a lie. A mm -hmm. complete and total lie. We are all mm -hmm. interconnected and, and, you know, really grasping that. I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I did not build this computer. I did not, you know, weave my clothes. I didn't, you know, make my glasses. I mean, they're just all these different things that um, I, I did not do for myself. And I'm not growing my own food right now. And um, one day, maybe I, I would like to do that. There was a book I read, um, uh, by Jen Hatmaker called Seven, an Experimental Mutiny Against Excess. And one of the things that she did is um, she turned her then backyard into an opportunity for folks to plant. And then um, the, the I, I forget, I think what it was is there was a, um, a shelter or there was a place where folks were looking for jobs. And so one of the ways they would, they would learn job skills, but one of the ways that they would sort of, you know, earn nights stay in this shelter, I might be getting this, the details wrong, would be they'd come work in her backyard producing food. And then the family who offers the land, they get X portion, like um, I don't know, 25% or 50% or whatever it is, then the, um, the folks who are working it, then they can take the other proceeds, take it to the farmer's market, and then from the proceeds, the money proceeds, then 
X would go to the shelter and X would go to the people. And so, you know, it was this constant um, wonderful flow of, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. And of course the whole sowing and reaping and seasonal things. And, um, you know, I, I understand now the importance of um, eating things in season. You know, if I, mm-hmm. um, you know, really mm-hmm. grasping, grasping that, but that whole free food forest here in Atlanta, Georgia, I mean, that lights me up. That is so exciting that we would expend our resources and our energy um, to ensure that folks have fresh food. And I think it's organic or pesticide free or whatever. And just beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. And how how does it look like when, in, if there are communities that, there, that a grocery store is a 30 minute bus ride away? And there are, there are more than you would imagine. And they're called food deserts. And, you know, when you think about a food desert here in the U.S., it seems unfathomable. Yeah. Yet it is very prevalent. And, um, you know, I, I love that, though. And to find out that there's something here in the Atlanta area, there is something like that that are in so many places around the U.S. And it's something that we... I think communities would want to think about doing even more of. Mm -hmm. I know that I was driving down Five Forks Trickham uh, last week, and there used to be a house on this land now that is fenced off, that there was a big sign up there that it's now a community garden. Wow. And I thought, oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not like it has to be some big hundred acre space somewhere. Mm-hmm. You can have these things right in your own community. So I remember seeing um, a documentary with uh, the, the gangster gardener who mm-hmm. in the middle of downtown LA has got a little spot on the side of a building. But the key for him was a lot of the garden is on the rooftop. Uh, a lot of the garden is like across the street where there was this tiny little plot that they could plant and it's seasonal, mm-hmm. you know, because that's the other thing too. We think that, okay, I'm growing tomatoes. All I can grow is tomatoes. You need to change out what's mm-hmm. growing in order to keep the soil nutrient rich because mm-hmm. some things will suck out the nutrients and you want to plant things the next right. season that are going to replace them and and make them better. But that's the same thing, the same concept that we can also relate to and equate to Mm -hmm. our social justice system. You know, there's um, things that occur in our communities and it's just like, do you know your neighbors? Right. Right. It's the last time you said hello to your neighbors, even if you've yeah. seen your neighbors. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that has permeated such a um, distance between us individually mm-hmm. in our own communities mm-hmm. that um, it just, it perpetuates this illness. Yes. Yes. Even, even we all have um, a definition of who is my neighbor, right? But every single person on this planet is our neighbor. Every single person is part of the global family. And so when, when, you know, when we think about our neighbors, I mean, that's actually the, the name of our church where we go is our neighbor's house. That, that's the name of our church. And we're building um, an educational center in Liberia because the globe is our neighborhood. Yes, so, it is. Yeah, when you think about your neighbor, you know, um, I I read and I, and now I don't remember who it was, but I read something recently where a, a man was saying that when he hires somebody, he always if it's you know one of the um, one of his upper management positions, he always takes them to lunch, and one of the deciding factors is how does that person treat the waitstaff. Mm. 
And so, uh, you know, how are we treating our neighbors? How are we treating the cashier, you know, at Aldi? I mean, when we walk in and we see Catherine there at our local Aldi, we're super excited. Hey, Catherine, how have you been? Blah, 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 blah. You know, um, sometimes she looks at me like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> you know, but everybody has a story. Every single person is important and vital and um and worthy of of being we're are worthy of us being neighborly to them and there is the aspect of love that creates that giving to each yes. other yeah and um i love what you said though that everyone is worthy of that mm -hmm. and you know if you believe that you can only give that to people that you know or people in your family then therein lies another opportunity for a mind shift. Right. You know, I am always just so grateful when I walk up to the door of something and, and you know, somebody is there before me and, you know, don't care who it is, but they see all this gray hair and they stand there and hold the door open for me. That is so awesome. Yeah. But then I can also tell you the number of times that it didn't matter to the person yeah. who was in front of me. And they went in and not only did they not hold the door, so at least I could grab it, mm -hmm. they let it close behind them. And I'm like, wow, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you're right. It is where we are now, recognizing all of that. And um, do you know, my mom, uh, my mom has a prayer journal. She, she writes her prayers every morning and my stepfather died in July and he prior before he died he had had an ocular stroke so he was blind in one eye and he only had 20 percent vision in the other and they were in the grocery store and um basically my, my parents are sugar and big daddy <laughs> yes we're from the south and so big daddy <laughs> was using the 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 cart as almost like a walker like he was holding on to it and using it as a walker my mom was shopping and so this guy walked past them i think the guy was maybe 25 or 30 and he looked down and he saw that big daddy's shoes were untied one of his shoes were untied so he didn't say hey sir your shoes untied he knelt down on one knee didn't ask knelt down on one knee and just tied it for big daddy and so mom talked about that for so long she still writes that man's name down I mean that man in her prayer journal she does not know his name but she says you know the man from the grocery store that tied you know big daddy's shoes and so um you know if you if you have a faith tradition at some point we believe that that person will understand that this this random act that he did for a stranger has prompted her to pray for him every single day since then and understanding that interconnectedness now again he could have said hey shoes untied and kept on going or he could have seen it and not said anything or he could have said to my mom hey your husband's shoe you know is untied but instead he just knelt and, and performed that and how how precious is that and how, how can we look for opportunities to be love to other people like that? Oh, that's beautiful. Now, I'm looking at the time and this, we probably could go on for another hour <laughs> in this conversation. Hours, hours. <laughs> I can't believe it's time because I'm telling you, I've enjoyed this. I have as well. And I wanted to ask because I'm certain that our audience can go for one last big nugget from you of wisdom that something that you feel is important to share in the short time we have left together. Oh, one big nugget. Uh, two things I'm going to say. Number one, go to thekingcenter.org. Check out everything that we have going on there. Um, think about that pledge and, and signing that pledge and think about signing up for the Be Love campaign and the other training that we'll be uh, rolling out um, you know, in terms of there's the Be Love campaign and then we do NV 365, Nonviolence 365 orientations and there'll be some other sessions. And so um, certainly be thinking about that. And I would say, make it your mission to talk to every single person that you know who is considering any form of higher education and let them know that they can do that debt free. Now, obviously, there's some caveats. I mean, it's it's harder to go to law school or med school debt free, but not impossible. And so, um, you know, just be thinking about that, understanding that mindset. Um, I talked to a lady the other day who wants to go to law school and um, 
she said she's two years into her bachelor's degree and so she says you know what are your what are you thinking about with law school because we were talking about if you work for an in-state institution in Georgia then your tuition and fees are covered at any other in-state institution and so she said does that count for law school and I said well you'll have to look at you know at each individual school I don't think so but you can look at it but my suggestion was get go get an LSAT guide today and study, study, study for the next two years and get the highest LSAT score you can and then see where that lands you. You know, there's just always ways to think about if it can't be completely debt free, how can we reduce debt in every way, shape or form? So um, that would be that would be my two things. Go to the kingcenter.org and check out all that is going on there and then making it your mission to make sure that folks don't just resort to blithely taking student loans without investigating other options. Beautiful, beautiful. And thank you so much for being in this dialogue with me, for bringing your wisdom and your beauty, just your big heart to the conversation. Um, and to our audience, as we wrap up, I want to make sure that you know how to reach Dr. Roz. You can reach her on her Facebook page. It will be posted in the comments below this video. And um, connect with her on Facebook. Connect with her on LinkedIn. Connect. Connect. Yes. That's what we're here doing. We're building this beloved community because our goal is to help you to connect into that which makes life better. I'm not going to say easier, but definitely better because, you know, a lot of things you can make easier and that's good. And a lot of things that you want to be easier just require a little bit of work to get there. And that's what this is going to take. And if you're a health wisdom or a wealth practitioner and you'd like to share your expertise to be in this conversation reach out to me pm me message me on facebook uh, on linkedin instagram i will get your message let's connect or you can email me vlynn at p3academy.com because my mission is to help voices like dr Roz be heard to be in the conversation and over the course of the next few seasons of the show, we're going to have some amazing presenters for you. We're going to be sharing some awesome information. We're going to have Dr. Oz back because, you know, a conversation like this isn't complete. <laughs> it requires a next level and a next level after that. So, okay, everyone, remember lots of great things coming up in future episodes. So stay tuned, join us back here again next week as we air another episode of the Health, Wisdom and Wealth TV show, Powerful Conversations for Living Your Best Life. This is Elin Hawkins, your host, and I am going to say farewell for now from Dr. Roz and thank me. Thank you, Elin. Such You're a welcome. wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here. Live, love, and be a bigger positive impact maker in the world. Yeah, that's right. We need you. Yeah, we do. And Absolutely. we will see you next time. Thanks again and bye for now. Bye-bye.